Hi students, we're going to go back to our reading of Escape from Warsaw. Before I read you chapter two, I'm going to do a quick review of chapter one. All right, so remember in chapter one, that's where we got some, um, we were introduced to the main characters of the story. Uh, the main characters are going to be the Belitsky family. They live in Warsaw, Poland. The time period is World War II. Probably it's about 1940 at the beginning of Chapter 1. Remember, the main character of Chapter 1 is Joseph Belitsky. He is the headmaster of a primary school in Warsaw, Poland. So let's think about what happened at the beginning of the chapter, the middle of the chapter, and the end of the chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, remember, Joseph was teaching his class. He was in the middle of teaching a Bible scripture lesson. He turned the picture of Adolf Hitler that the Nazis had hung. Remember, they had hung one of these pictures in every classroom in uh, Poland. And during the middle of his Bible lesson, he turned that picture over to face the wall. Remember, somebody turned him in. And that's what led to what happened in the middle of the chapter, which was what? Yes, that's when the stormtroopers broke into his home in the middle of the night and they drug him away from his wife and his children and they took him and they threw him in the prison camp at Zakina. He, we know he stayed there at least two winters because it talked about how he was sick both of those winters. He tried to escape one time, but he was caught, and all he really wanted to do was get out and reunite with his family. And that desire is what led to the big thing that happened at the end of chapter one, which was what? You're right. That's when, after a lot of planning, he was able to escape from the prison camp. Remember, he attacked the guard when he was in the cooler cell. He took the guard's clothing after he knocked the guard out. He took the guard's clothing. He took the guard's keys. He left the guard in the cooler cell. He was dressed as the guard, and he walked right out the front gate at the changing of the guard. He walked right out with the other prison guards. And that's what leads us in to chapter two. All right, so I want you to find a quiet place, that some place where you won't be distracted by anybody. But make sure you don't pick such a quiet place that uh, you fall asleep, okay? I just want you to get in a good and comfortable place um, so you can listen well. I want you to listen carefully because we could have a quiz at the end of this chapter. All right, Chapter 2 of Escape from Warsaw. This is called Journey Through the Air. The village of Zakina was a mile below the camp. It was a mass of tiny huts clinging to the steep cliffside. There was no moon that night, but Joseph could see lights in the windows. He walked straight through the village. Suddenly he was challenged in German. Carl, give me the cigarettes, said a rough voice. He took no notice and walked on. Carl, the cigarettes, the voice shouted threateningly. He hurried on. on. There were footsteps behind him. He turned round to look. A drunken soldier was tottering after him. Joseph began to run. The soldier ran too, swearing whenever he stumbled. Just below the last huts in the village, the road curled away from the cliff, de cliff edge. A mail car had pulled up. 
Its lights were on and the engine running. There was a pile of luggage in the road and an angry group, group of people had gathered round. You're two hours late, someone cried. I told you there was an avalanche. The road was blocked, returned the driver. Joseph dived behind the white wall of snow that the snow plow had thrown up on the side of the road. He was right on the edge of the cliff, which dropped steeply into the darkness. He heard the sound of crates being dumped in the road, and he heard the drunken soldier roll up and cry, Driver, you've pinched my cigarettes! Chuck him over the cliff, said someone. A scuffle, laughter, steps coming towards him. Joseph slid quietly away to where a square shape jutted out from the road. In the dark, it looked like a cart without wheels. Quickly, he hid underneath. At once, he wished he hadn't moved. A heavy crate banged down on the boards above his head. The boards quivered and shook, and boots scraped the wood shuffled along the snow. There was a babble of voices, jokes, and leg-pulling mixed with the directions for the loading of the crates. Joseph waited tensely while the crates were lifted in and the tarpaulin draped over them. When the soldiers were back in the road, he heaved himself over the wooden edge and under the tarpaulin. A loud voice shouted, Are you ready there? From the other side of the dark valley came an answering call. Suddenly Joseph realized that the wooden boards he lay on were moving. They were sliding out into the darkness away from the road. Where was he? As soon as he dared, he lifted the edge of the tarpaulin and looked out. He was in a kind of roofless cage. It was hung by pulleys and wire to an overhead cable and was swinging giddily from side to side. An aerial luggage lift. These were quite common in the mountains. They were driven by electricity and used for carrying goods from one side of a steep valley to the other. Joseph sighed with relief. The giddy movement of the cage made him feel sick, but he knew that every second it was taking him farther from his enemies. Then suddenly the cage squealed to a standstill. It began to slide back, back to the road. The voices on the road grew louder. A jerk, a rattle of pulleys, the scrape of wood on snow, and he was back where he had started. Someone leapt into the cage and lifted the tarpaulin on the other side of the crates from Joseph. There's room for it alongside. Hurry up, cried the voice. Joseph's hand was in his revolver holster. He meant to fight his way out if he had to, but all he could feel in the holster was a stick of chocolate. Another crate was chucked in and kicked along the other pair and kicked alongside the other pair pardon me it banged against his foot and nearly made him scream with pain he fell back and bit his lip groaning but no one heard his groans for the cage was already rattling out into the darkness again while he rubbed his bruised toes it pitched and swung from side to side after a few minutes of climbing, a shape loomed toward him and rattled past. It was the balance lift, the descending cage which balanced the weight of the climbing one, and it meant he had passed the halfway mark. Ahead of him was the black shape of the mountain. With every swing of the cage and every creak of the cable, it came nearer. Were there soldiers on that side, too? If so, what was he to do? He could not escape discovery, and he was quite unarmed. In a flash, he made up his mind. He lifted the tarpaulin from his shoulders and sat with his back to the crates, facing the dark mountain. All right.
Later, I'll read you chapter 3. Now, there were a couple of words in this chapter that you might not have been familiar with. Uh, one of them was the word tarpaulin. We use that word a lot, only we use it in an abbreviated form. We call them tarps. So, recently we had a hailstorm here and a bunch of people have had to have their roofs replaced. They've had blue tarps on their roofs uh, where they had to have their shingles fixed. Or if you're carrying something in a trailer, you might put a tarp over it so as you're driving down the road, stuff doesn't come flying out of the trailer. Or if you're driving down the road and it begins to rain, that your stuff in the trailer doesn't get wet. So a tarp is meant to protect some sort of cargo or something underneath it. Okay, a luggage lift. I want you to think of if you've ever seen a, a ski lift or um, a tram that goes up a mountain. Um, that would be kind of like what it is, only it was open at the top. It was like a cage and it was open at the top. Um, I think those are the only two words that uh, are the only two things that you might not have been familiar with. Did you catch the part where Joseph put his hand in the holster expecting to find the soldier or the guard's gun there? And he didn't find a gun there. Instead, he found a bar of chocolate. I bet that was an unexpected thing that he did not expect to find. He thought he was going to be able to defend himself, but it turned out he wasn't because you can't, you can't do much with a bar of chocolate except for maybe share it. All right. Um, the next time I talk to you, I'll be reading you Chapter 3.